All right. Beautiful. Thank you, Chantel. Um, thank you all for coming. I've been affiliated with the Growth Network for whew, probably since it started, right? So it's a real pleasure for me to come back to this group and have a chance to share um, essentially an update, because I've gotten to present here before, an update on where we are and some of the work that we're doing. So uh, my focus is going to be on exercise and cognition in older adults. And I start just by giving you some, some background, which is to say um, there is a lot of work that's been done in this area for a very long time. And through statistical reviews of the accumulated body of evidence, we feel really confident in saying um, that there's a beneficial effect of exercise for cognition. This is true if we're looking at a single session of exercise that we implement before somebody does a cognitive task or a single session of exercise that we implement before somebody's asked to remember something that they might be asked to recall up to 24 hours later. Um, that's not my, the focus of my talk today, but we do have a, a pretty active line of scholarship that's focused on really understanding how you can use acute exercise to benefit memory, and we've been looking across the lifespan. But what I want to talk to you about today is our work in the area of chronic physical activity. And again, there's a, there's a large body of evidence that exists already, and it consistently shows us that if we take a cross-sectional approach and just say, I'm going to compare people who are more active to people who are less active, or people who are more aerobically fit to people who are less aerobically fit, we consistently see differences in cognition. But you all well know that that's cross-sectional research, so it has its limitations. Um, we also know, and it's sort of a step up in terms of, of the experimental design, that if we look at people at baseline and we follow them prospectively forward, that we can see differences in their cognitive trajectory over time relative to how they started, relative to physical activity or fitness. And then, of course, um, we also have some randomly controlled trials where we take sedentary people, randomly assign them to become active or to stay with their normal lifestyle, and then see what happens. And again, it consistently shows that we get benefits. Um, most of the work that I've done is based on this hypothesis called the cognitive reserves hypothesis, which essentially tells us that cognitive reserves develop over time, that they're important for predicting cognitive uh, performance, and that it's essentially, if you think of it, it's sort of like a vat of cognitive reserves that we fill um, partly just through developmental processes. So as we age on those graphs, you can see age across the x-axis, some measure of cognitive performance on the y-axis makes sense, right? Kids are getting better at tasks as they, as they get older. And we think that that's because they're developing cognitive reserves. We also know that cognitive reserves decline with advancing age. So unfortunately, in addition to the spigot that's putting stuff in, there's also a spigot that's taking things out. And we see this, a lot of this work comes from Tim Salthouse's work, um, where we know that with advancing age, from the time that we're in our 20s and 30s, um, we start to see some pretty steady declines that are age related. Um, I don't know if this steeper decline at 65 is real or if it's some sort of an artifact, um, but certainly we're interested in looking at older adults because of the implications um, of cognitive decline for them. So successful aging, um, we think that even during aging, you can add things into your cognitive reserves through a host of activities, um, education, continuing education opportunities, social support, continued mental activity. The one that I'm focused on is physical activity. So let me now orient you a bit to the focus that we specifically have, which is um, the cognitive performance of people as it relates to dementia. And probably everybody in this room is well aware that there is a growing um, potentially crisis as it relates to how we're going to have a larger older population and therefore we're going to have larger numbers of people who are living with dementia. And this is expected to happen at, in all areas of the world. What maybe, you, maybe everybody in this room isn't familiar with is that there is a genetic predictor of Alzheimer's. There's, there's actually lots of, there's a host of genetic predictors of Alzheimer's, but this is the strongest susceptibility gene for Alzheimer's. And it's called apolipoprotein E or APOE. And the alleles that we're interested in, um, the ones that are predictive of Alzheimer's is the E4 allele. But there are actually three alleles, the E2, the E3, and the E4. And you get one copy from your biological mother, one copy from your biological father. So you have some pairing of a combination of two, three, and four. And so what we know is that in North Americans of European descent, the majority of individuals are actually three, three, which means the, the E3 allele is kind of the neutral allele. 
So you have no enhanced genetic risk based on this gene of Alzheimer's disease. Um, you still have a chance of having Alzheimer's by the time you're 80. It's about 3%. The age of onset is usually around the young, young, young 70s. Then there's a group of folks who make up about a quarter of the population. Um, they have one copy of the E4 allele, so they'd be called heterozygous, and they have an increased likelihood of Alzheimer's. You can see it goes up to about 8% at 80 years of age, um, and the age of onset is similar. The group that we're most concerned about is the folks who unfortunately have two copies of the E4 allele. That occurs in about 2% of the population, but about half of them, I'm going to show you some other numbers that suggest even a higher percentage, but based on some studies, about half of them are likely to have dementia by the time they're 80. And the age of onset is, is dramatically lower, which as you can imagine has big implications for quality of life, for caregivers, for time with children and grandchildren, those kinds of things. So um, this is another way of sort of looking at the risk of Alzheimer's that is conferred by this gene. And so it's kind of a funny graph, and I, I couldn't, I don't have the data, so I couldn't figure out a way to flip it. But the, the um, y-axis is showing the fraction of non-converted subjects. So with the 40-year-olds, it's a flat line at the top. 100% of people have not converted to MCI or Alzheimer's disease. But as you go forward in time or advancing age, you start to see this, the lines come down, which means that there are fewer people who have not converted as you move towards the bottom. So if you look at just 80-year-olds, for instance, and the solid line is the non-carriers, the dashed line is the carriers. <coughs> so if you look at non-carriers at 80 years of age, about 58% have not converted at about, uh, of women, and about 24% of men have not converted which is, is kind of startling, really, because by 80 years of age, many of us are going to start to experience MCI or Alzheimer's regardless of our genetic risk. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But if you look at the carriers by 80 years of age, only 8% of women have not converted, and all men have converted. I mean, that's pretty dreadful, right? I back the age up just a little bit to give you another way of looking at it. So if you look at 70 years of age, which to me is still like a happy, healthy, young age, should be, right? You're only a few years after retirement. <laughs> or still working. Um, but you can see that for the carriers at 70 years of age, about 42% have already converted. And if you're talking about men, it's a little bit higher, 56% converted. By well, you're not converted. They're now being diagnosed of having MCI. At least, at least MCI? Yes, at least MCI. That's right. That's right. That's right. Yep. So, so I told you that there's this big body of evidence that shows that exercise helps cognition. So mm -hmm. what's left to be done, right? Mm -hmm. Well, what we're interested in doing is understanding if exercise has a specific role to play in the prevention or protection against dementia. Now, all of my work that we've done to date is with cognitively normal. So everything that we're doing is looking at, can we do something now? Can we intervene now in a way that would have implications to hopefully protect against, delay, prevent Alzheimer's disease? But I'm not following people out far enough to see that. So I just wanna make sure I say that ahead of time. We're, all, we're always looking at people who are relatively younger and are all cognitively normal. So the question then is, does physical activity offer benefits to middle-aged older people who have a family history of Alzheimer's, because that increases their risk of having Alzheimer's, and also who have a genetic risk for Alzheimer's? Um, and then we're trying to take a really comprehensive approach. We're measuring everything you can think of to measure. So we do about three and a half to four hours of cognitive testing, every behavioral measure of cognition that you can pretty much think of. Um, we're getting blood samples, we're doing resting state and functional MRI, um, and we're getting measures of fitness. Oh, and we're getting, did I say blood samples? We're getting blood samples as well, so we can look at biological markers. So I started in this work a long time ago. I was at Arizona State University for a period of time. And when I was out there, I had the pleasure of um, getting to work together with some of the researchers who are involved in the longitudinal work that the Mayo Clinic is doing that relates to Alzheimer's. They have a big group of folks who they've been following longitudinally for a very long period of time. And so when I was at ASU, I was able to recruit some people from their study to come take part in our work. Wow which was basically to measure fitness, because that's the thing that they're not doing at the Mayo Clinic. So we had cognitively normal older women, 51 to 81 years of age, they have a family history of Alzheimer's. 
we measured, uh, we had the genotype information from them. We had some cognitive performance information from them and we measured aerobic fitness and added some other cognitive measures. So in this graph, um, the people who are in the solid circles, the filled in circles are the ones who are, and I didn't use this term yet, but they're homozygous for the E4 allele. They have both copies of the E4 allele and they're the highest genetic risk with the genetic marker that we measured. And then the gray ones are the ones who are heterozygous and the open circles are the people who don't have a copy of the E4 allele. The X axis is fitness. The Y axis is a measure of cognition that we used. And what we find is that there is not a significant relationship for the non-carriers or the heterozygous, but that solid line represents, and you can see how the black circles sort of fall pretty closely on that line. It represents and shows a really strong relationship between fitness and cognitive performance for the people who have both copies of the E4 allele, although they're cognitively normal. Okay, right. Right? So essentially what it's suggesting is that the co they're cognitively normal. So I don't, I don't think that the relationship goes in the reverse direction, where it's because they're more fit, they're able to stay more engaged and all these other things that help their cognition. I think it goes in the direction of if they're more fit, that's providing them some protection that's allowing their cognitive performance to be better. And it really matters if you have this great genetic risk for Alzheimer's. So that was cross-sectional, right? So the next study that we did was here at UNCG. It was the PAD-1 study, but we didn't know there was going to be a PAD-2. So there's no one at the end. <laughs> it was just a PAD study. Um, and it was observational. So it was supported by an RO3. We didn't have enough money in that, in that funding mechanism to, to support having a control condition. Mm -hmm. So essentially, it was kind of pilot work that said, we're going to come in and we're going to recruit, um, again, people who are cognitively normal, 50 to 65, and we're going to assess cognitive performance at zero, four, and eight months relative <coughs> to participation in the exercise program. So everybody gets the exercise, which I actually, in some ways, like better than the PAD-2 study, because the PAD-2 study, we asked some people to maintain their normal lifestyle. Mm -hmm. In this one, everybody got exercise. It feels ethically and morally better because I think it's going to help them, right? Everybody gets it. But of course, the shortcoming is there's no control, right? So um, what we were able to do was, because of my relationship with the folks at the Mayo Clinic, they were willing to share some of their longitudinal data that I was able to use as a comparison to say, this is what would happen just with repeated exposure to the tests. Right. I'm assuming that the people in there, I, I had to make some assumptions. I had to assume that the people in their population are probably not very active. At least they're not engaged in a structured activity program like we were providing. Um, but they're similar in every other way. Right. They're cognitively normally have a family history of Alzheimer's. We matched for um, the genetic status, those kinds of things. And so what we find is that on all of these measures, I didn't spell them all out, but all of these are measures of memory, which is where we're typically looking for these Alzheimer's studies. And the red line shows the Mayo folks, and you can see that on most of the measures, they don't show any change over time. So there's not a real learning effect. Maybe on the delayed recall, just a smidge, but it's probably not significant. But what's important is that the CAD folks are showing an increase in cognitive performance, that blue line from pre to mid to post that is greater than is observed in this comparison group that we chose to use. So it's suggesting, it's making the, it's sort of making a stronger hint, I should say, that um, the changes that we're seeing aren't due to learning because the Mayo folks would have had learning. They're not due to just the normal passage of time because the Mayo folks had the normal passage of time. They, they could more than likely be due to the physical activity intervention. So, what we did next is the trial that we're, we're um, still in the midst of, which is the PAD-2 study, supported by an R01, which means that we have been able to include a control group in this study. And so in this study, what we're doing is um, we actually lowered the age range a little bit. So we were doing 50 to 65, now we're doing 40 to 65. And the reason is, my rationale is sort of thinking of that cognitive reserve hypothesis and thinking, there might be a window of opportunity in terms of a malleable brain where the exercise could have a bigger benefit than if we wait until they're 65. If I wait until they're 65, some of them may be starting to have subjective memory complaints, right? Now I've got people who are cognitively normal and I think are really pre any kinds of clinical symptoms of Alzheimer's disease or dementia. So 
we um, at the pretest we get all these measures that I was mentioning. It's it's essentially the same um, stuff that we did with the pad study. Then we randomly assign them. Uh, we lengthen the intervention so it's not eight months anymore. It's twelve months, and that's partly because there's another multi-site study that was going on at the same time, looking at 65 to 80 year olds and doing a one-year intervention. So we wanted to be able to one day say, hey, can we pull our data together? We're doing a lot of things similarly, and can we look at differences across this whole age span from 40 to 85? Um, it is the case that the people who are in the control group are given money to pay for a three-month membership at the YMCA, and we encourage them to use that to get started on that physical activity program. Um, and then we do a mid-test at six months and a post-test at the, at the end, obviously. So before the pandemic, I share this partly just because I think it's really kind of fascinating. I've never done a study through a pandemic before, right? So this is, this is the first one. I got to enjoy that. Before the pandemic, we were face-to-face. -face. We were at the downtown YMCA. We had exercise instructors meeting with um, the participants. Um, it was a lot of fun because we all came together. It was similar to how we'd done the PAD study. The PAD study, everybody came to Coleman Gym on campus. And so there was a social support aspect of it that's harder to recreate in a virtual environment. Um, we also did the cognitive testing, like we were seriously sitting right by them because we had to watch what they were doing and we had to give them feedback. Um, it's kind of funny in hindsight how close we sat to them and, and how, <laughs> how closely we worked with them, right? So after the pandemic, um, I don't know if you can see, but the exercise was done virtually. We had Zoom sessions. That's what we're still doing. We have Zoom-based sessions. Um, the adherence is actually really, really high, which I'm pleased about, maybe not surprised about. Um, it's easier for people to go get on their laptop or their desktop than it is to drive all the way down to the downtown Y. They can fit it in around while they're making dinner. Um, it wasn't a full hour anymore because we just do the strength training together, the walking they do on their own. Um, and then obviously we're collecting exercise logs and all of that to, to confirm what they're actually doing. Um, I had the good fortune and still have the good fortune of having a postdoc who's here at UNCG named Dr. Shin Park, who is a miracle worker as far as I'm concerned. He essentially programmed three and a half hours worth of cognitive testing to be all delivered by an avatar all of it's recorded. Oh, wow. He used Google Voice. Um, we sit six feet apart. Everybody was masked for most of, you know, for most of about a two-year period. We no longer have to look over their shoulder because we have a document camera. It's all, and, and we don't touch anything. Like all the stuff on the right, the iPad, the files, you know, the files get put up 24 hours ahead of time. The person's wearing gloves when they put the files out. Like all the stuff that we had to do back when the ramping up research was a real challenge. We did it actually really quickly, and we're starting research, starting data collection again about six months after after the pandemic was recognized. You know, after everything got shut down. Are you going to keep doing it that way? We're going to keep doing it that way. It provides a lot of standardization that we didn't have before, which mm -hmm. is wonderful. Um, and you know, there's always something. I don't want anybody's flu or anybody's COVID or anybody's RSV or the cold. You know, like it just like I said in hindsight, it's like why were we ever sitting so close together, <laughs> especially if we're bringing in older adults, right? Like, why wouldn't we use every precaution that we think of? So yeah, we'll keep, we'll keep doing it this one. Um, now, not with the exercise, but with the testing, yeah. Um, where we are now, I hope you can see that. So we had almost 800 people expressed interest in the study. Um, it goes through all these levels of screening, right? Are they still eligible, <laughs> eligible after this, after that, after this, after that? We ended up enrolling 180. Um, and that's partly because, I don't know if any of you know Brittany Armstrong, but she's also the world's best project coordinator. Um, she just was not going to be happy with 177. She's like 180 is beautiful and we will get to 180. <laughs> okay, <laughs> let's do it. So, so we did. Um, what I'm going to share with you now is some of the preliminary findings. So right now we have three cohorts who are still continuing. We enroll people in cohorts of about 16. Um, and so there, we are trying to recreate the social and group environment in the virtual world. So they all come at the same time. We, we open up the Zoom session about 10 or 15 minutes early so that they can come in and, and interact with one another. Then the exercise instructor joins and then we leave it open for about 10 or 15 minutes after, again, to try to let them socialize if they would want to. It turns out that's pretty important because these are people with a family history of Alzheimer's many of whom are either current caregivers or have seen a grandparent, they want to talk to other people. 
right? So the social support part, I think, is really important aspect of what we do. Um, most of what I'm going to present to you today, no, I think, let me take that back. I think all of what I'm going to present to you today is just pretest data because we don't have everybody through the whole protocol yet, but still some pretty fascinating stuff. So at the pretest, if we look at the impact of APOE or status, and in this case, we have carriers, so either have one copy or two copies of the E4 allele versus non-carriers who are in the yellow, we are seeing differences in cognitive performance that we can measure on certain types of cognitive tests. Not everything. They're all cognitively normal. I'm surprised we can tell them apart at all, right? But if we look at some specific measures that we think should be pretty sensitive to any early kinds of declines, we see significant differences with the carriers performing slightly worse than the non-carriers. Okay. If we look at fitness, again, cross-sectionally, now, I don't think I said this. All of the people are, are sedentary, which means they are not meeting the recommended guidelines. And we set that pretty low. So we said if you're doing 90 minutes or more of physical activity per week, you can't be in the study. So they're all doing, I guess they're doing 89 minutes or less, right? They're doing, they're doing less than the 90 minutes. Um, even so, we can still categorize them as being really sedentary or just sedentary, right? So we just did a median split. And said, so this is the group that's really highly sedentary, and this is the group that at least is getting some movement. And when you do that, on um, eight out of nine measures, we see a significant difference in the direction that high sedentariness, you perform worse cognitively. If you're highly sedentary, if you're the most sedentary, if you're in that group, that half, then you perform the worst cognitively, which again is kind of crazy because they're a pretty homogeneous group. Right? We don't have really active people. We have, we have all low active, and now we're saying these are the lowest, and these are the next lowest. What's really cool is that we looked at the same relationship that I showed you from the work that I did at ASU, where we have fitness on the x-axis. It is a different cognitive measure. It's a cognitive measure that we think is really sensitive to hippocampal um, uh, performance, and hippocampus is what you start to see the declines in at the very beginning with Alzheimer's. So we pick this one that's really sensitive, and in this one, the carriers are going to be in blue and the non-carriers are in yellow. And what you see is a very similar relationship where the carriers are showing a positive relationship between fitness and cognitive performance that is not observed in the non-carriers. So in the non-carriers, what I think is that their cognitive performance is, is still really, really good. Not only are they cognitively normal, but they're really, really good. So the fitness is not making as big of a difference. But in the carriers, there's starting to be some subtle declines that we can measure, and we can see then that fitness does make a difference for them. And can I just real quick sure. question? They don't know their status, correct? They do not know their status. I'm glad you asked that. Yeah, we don't tell them their status because there's no solution, right? There's nothing we can't say, you're a carrier, and so, hey, you should be taking this medicine. There's nothing like that yet. I mean, you guys probably know we're on the, we're on the cusp of that, we think. There's some pharmacologic um, interventions that they're looking at, but right now the risks seem to outweigh the rewards. You'd have to be really thoughtful about if you were gonna take that medicine or not. Yeah. How would you know outside of these studies if these people wanted to find out if they had this? They can get it. 21 and me or whatever it is. Oh, okay. You, you can get it done easily. Okay. Yeah, you can easily get it done. And some of our participants do know. Some of our participants have found out. But we don't tell them okay. because we would be telling them and yeah, then having nothing yeah. else to provide. Okay. My brother is a <coughs> genetic salesman. That's, not <laughs> oh, that's what he does full time. Is he's in, it's considered pharmaceutical sales, but he basically sells genetic testing to different doctors' offices. He works for a company, so it's pretty. It's pretty. It's a lot easier than you realize. Okay. People have to be really thoughtful about it if they want to know mm -hmm. or not. Right. If you find out that you have both copies, that could be pretty devastating. And the only reason I was asking, I was just thinking to myself, if you knew, would you be working harder? Oh, I'm with you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They don't know. They don't know. There was a, a famous actor that came out very recently. The really good-looking. No, 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 the really yeah. good-looking Australian ones, Hemsworth. Oh, Chris. He, that's right. Yeah, he found out that he's he was an APOE carrier. Okay. Um, and it, he taught, he's been very open and talked about what it meant. And he's physic, obviously physically, physically active, fit, right, 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 fit, right, but right. he talked a lot about, <laughs> um, 
he talked a lot about um, what it, the implications it had for his decision making for his future because he's a father and a husband and what it meant for his long term life plans. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think some people may certainly want to know so that they mm -hmm. can. And, and as we start to have answers, then it could become really important, right? And you're reducing, you used to mention Alzheimer's kind of, but you're really I talking am, but we about really are Alzheimer's. talking about Alzheimer's, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah I shouldn't be careless about Okay, well, I'm not just yeah. trying to make yeah. sure, because... And we are we are excluding people who have vascular dementia. I mean, we're, we're recruiting for a family history, right? So we're asking them, is it Alzheimer's? Now, if their first degree relative was um, was diagnosed with dementia and they didn't further say what it was, then we are accepting them okay. because I mean, right now, I know, the highest know. percentage of dementia is right. Alzheimer's. Well, yeah. But if they say that it's Lewy body or they say that it's vascular, then we would not count that as having a family history of Alzheimer's disease. Because I, I mean, I just realized they didn't know really when my grandmother had dementia, that's they didn't right. even think about testing they it. That's right. right. They didn't know how that's to right. do it. That's so right. So I wouldn't know what kind she had. Yeah. And we, we're we using people who, including people who have a first degree relative or two second degree relatives, which increases the risk. So um, so I just put those up side by side because it's pretty it's pretty remarkable, really, how how similar those findings are in studies that were conducted about 20 years apart and a slightly different age range. And and the one on the right was just women. And this one is men and women, although our sample is predominantly women. Um, so just as a summary, in older cognitively normal adults with a family history of Alzheimer's disease, our cross-sectional evidence tells us that there are detectable differences in memory performance relative to APOE. There are detectable differences in cognitive performance more broadly defined relative to physical activity participation. And there's an association between fitness and cognitive performance. Um, the two studies were slightly different. The first one from ASU was 51 to 81 year olds who were um, homozygous. And then the second one was 50 to 65 year olds. Oh, I wrote that in wrong. 40 to 65 year olds, I'm sorry, who are carriers. But it's essentially the same. It's the same message. Um, our observational uh, evidence supports an association between physical activity and improved cognitive performance. And now I apologize. I can't remember what the next bullet says. Oh, good. That's what I wanted it to say. Um, our current RCT had two. What we hope and expect to find, what our hypothesis is, is that we will see improvements in cognitive performance for everybody. We don't know yet if we would expect to see bigger improvements for the carriers than the non-carriers. I've always sort of thought we would, but I have a um, Jeff Laban, who some of you may know, mm -hmm. um, was my former student, and so he's been engaged in this work with me for a really long time. He keeps trying to say, you know, it's okay if both groups improve the same. And that's, that's true, right? Because if the carriers get the same benefit as the non-carriers, that would still be really, really important. Even if the carriers got a slightly smaller benefit than the non-carriers for some reason, that would be important. But if they get a bigger benefit because there's something that they need that they're getting from being active, that to me would be the most the most powerful finding that we could, that we could report. Um, so future directions. This is literally hot off the express presses. I was just I was some. I was just shared some information last week that like gave me chills because of how important it is to what we're doing and what we're trying to do. And so, some of you may already know this, but they've developed some new assays that allow them to actually measure tau in the blood. And most of you probably know that it's the amyloid plaques and the neurofibrillary tangles that are tau and protein that are the hallmark of Alzheimer's. Well, if we can measure it in our blood samples, which we can, then we're going to have something that is a direct biomarker, directly linked to Alzheimer's disease. Not something like we had all these blood-based biomarkers that we were going to measure, and, and seven years ago when we proposed the study, oh, wow, yeah. they were the most important ones. But they're, you know, neuroinflammatory markers, a host of them that's loosely related that we think could eventually mediate some relationship that gets to Alzheimer's, or they're you know, glucose, they're irisin, they're things that are metabolic things or fitness things. This, this means that 
we, we, we can't do PET. We didn't do PET with PET too. We don't have a medical facility here. I don't know that we would have done it well, anyway. It's so burdensome and so expensive. Oh, and we right. already had a pretty burdensome study. Right. But we have the blood samples and there is evidence that shows that those blood samples are predictive of the load, predictive of the tau neurofibrillary tangle load. Mm. It is amazing. Like, so we're going to be able to say, and, and maybe our cognitive, you know, we do all those cognitive tests because, again, these are people who are cognitively normal. We don't know how sensitive those measures are going to be. Are those measures going to move in response to a one-year exercise program? I think so. We've got MRI measures. Is that going to change? Is cerebral structure going to change in one year in response to a physical activity program? I think so. But we're really interested in Alzheimer's. And this is like a direct, is as direct as we can get, but, but so much more direct than what we had, indication of, of, of what's going on in the central nervous system for these folks. So um, I, I sort of want to bring back to sort of the big um, kind of umbrella sort of a picture, which is this solid line shows um, the increase in the number of Americans with Alzheimer's disease in the millions going across in time, the forecast for the upcoming couple of decades. That dotted line is how that would change if we could delay the onset of Alzheimer's by five years. Wow, that's pretty remarkable. So, and, and I mean, you could think of, of it on a person level. If you could delay the onset of Alzheimer's by five years on the individual level for that person and for their family, for society. Well, and, I mean, I hate to say, but the financial aspect yeah. of that is, is huge. Well, and if, if you delay it by five years, and this, I don't mean for this to sound, it will sound bad, but, but if you're talking about a 67-year-old and you delay it for five years, they may die of some other cause, right? right? right. Alzheimer's is no fun. I just lost my dad to Alzheimer's in May. Oh, God. It is not a fun path for the person, for the family. So if you could delay it by five years and they die from something else that's like this, I know. that would be a lot easier to deal with. Is the, is the number, this is going to sound like an obvious question. So obviously we have a lot more people in the United States coming into these age groups over yeah. the next, is that why it's going up so yes. much? Okay. Yeah, it's, it's not, not like there's an increased right. there's percentage. Like that. Right. It's just no. the fastest growing segment in the population right. is now like nine. That's it. Right. Okay. That's it. I, I thought there was some increase, though, in comparing baby boomers to silent generation. I thought there was a higher rate also. I, if, I, if there is, I don't know my yet, Rebecca, but if you know where the paper is, share it with me. Higher rate with, with who? With, with the younger, yeah, with the younger cohort, I thought the incidents had gone up. That would be interesting. To, I had not heard that, but I could be totally wrong. But I thought if you can find it, yeah, it. send it my way. Um, so I guess the other thing I want to talk about is like the challenge, right? So I'm telling you that we think physical activity can help, but this data from this huge study, and there's lots like it, shows that people in the 65 and over age group fewer than 20% of them are meeting the recommendations for physical activity participation, strength training, aerobic, and we, we know that, right? Fewer than 20%. So what I want to tell you about next is this study that we're getting ready to do, which is called I-STEP. And essentially, um, it's an exercise intervention that incorporates rhythmic entrainment, and it kind of capitalizes on innate tendencies to move in synchrony with the beat, I don't know if this will work, Chantel. It worked on my computer. I think Fingers it will. Crossed. Yeah. Where do I go to it? Oh, so you're <laughs> it. Yeah, there it goes. Yeah. yeah. Can Wait. you see on your end? Let me see if I can just click this. And then even in little babies, I don't know how I get this one to work now. I thought it's the one I was on. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> so there's there's lots of evidence that, that there's an innate tendency to move with the feet. And um, there's a hedonic theory which suggests that we do that because it brings us pleasure. And so we're trying to capitalize on that with our I-STEP study, which um, is going to begin in 2024, this February. We're going to recruit 110 older adults. 109. Six, but you're going to recruit me. 
Oh, yeah? <laughs> My parents are coming too. Oh, lovely. I love it. I love it. Um, I can two more. They have to be ambulatory and they have to be, you know, low active to start with, right? And I'll, I'll make sure I'm low active. Right? All right. They get a six month they get a six month exercise intervention with faded supervision. So we're gonna have them come to campus three times a week for the first two months. We're gonna teach them how to walk with music. We're going to create personalized soundtracks, basically, and they're gonna have um, beat accentuated music if you end up in that group or you'll just have the normal exercise program. And what we're trying to find out is if the beat accentuated music helps people mm -hmm. to adhere to the exercise Please protocol. Find that out. That is so cool. I know that's a little touches yeah, on the So um, yeah. people will get randomly assigned to one group or the other. And then um, we're predicting that the group with music, I shouldn't say this if you guys are going to participate. Oh, I will. Don't, <laughs> don't yeah, close your ears. Um, they'll have more positive affect lower ratings of RPE and also better adherence is what we just lab. So we're trying to, the work that we've been doing so far is trying to show physical activity helps. Now we're switching the gears a little bit saying, okay, well, how can we try to help get people to be more physically active? Um, so this is the team. This is a big part of the team. It's a huge team, nice. a pad two group. Um, I really appreciate all the help that they give me. And then of course I'll add this caveat. So that is it. It's, I mean, it's awesome. So many, some are faculty, Dr. Lori Weidman, Dr. Chris Walheim, Chris is in psych, Lori's in my department, Bill Carper's in my department, but um, <coughs> Alexis Slutsky Ganesh was my student, but now she's um, working for Emory, but still consults on the grant, helps us with the MRI stuff. Jeff Laban was my student, but now he's in the Office of Research for the School of HHS as the data, data person. Uh, Dr. Shin Park, finished his degree about five years ago. I'm lucky for me, he came here. And he's, he's really the head person on ISTEP. It's his, oh, really? it's right. his, it's his ideas that we're, that we're pursuing with ISTEP. Hedessa Holder I, has just been a phenomenal addition to our team and, and we were able to hire her through a diversity supplement provided by NA, which I'm just so thrilled about. She's been with us for three years and now is applying for medical school. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't have to tell you all of them, but the one, the next four that come across are, um, well, no, Brittany, I should mention. Brittany is amazing. She's been at UNCG for maybe, does anybody know, 15 or 20 years. She's been on the right track. She's, she was in HCFS for a long time as a project coordinator. Now I was lucky enough to hire her when they were in between nice. studies. She's remarkable. 